We're having a remedial class now, which is a repeat for all those that weren't able to see the regional presentation of the head. Dan did a magnificent PowerPoint, and Beth and Clay were part of it. We're going to kind of cut it down a little because everyone's getting tired and hungry. And Dan will start out with some explanations, and we're going to have several dogs in here for them to explain certain parts of the dog that you might not understand in the heads. Can you guys see that photo up above clearly? All right. We'll try to do this in uh, express mode. Um, the, the breed type for boxers was first envisioned uh, um, in the beginning of uh, last century. In 1905, and I put a question mark there because not, I'm not 100% sure exactly the date the Munich sil silhouette was designed, and that was the idea of what the proper profile of the boxer head would be. So this, this is a man-made breed. This was uh, envisioned to be something that looked like that. In the late twen 20s, that's uh, Frau Stockman with some of her boxers. You can see that her dogs at the time had a longer muzzle and not quite that profile that was envisioned. Through selective breeding, through breeders that really knew and understood what the concepts and fundamentals of, of the boxer head uh, are, uh, a process of, of uh, developing um, the proper boxer head was started. Uh, we have war Warlord, uh, Bangaway, Flying High, and then the current uh, uh, modern boxer, where you can see the development of the stop, the, the, the turn up of nose, the well-developed underjaw, and all these parameters end up uh, uh, creating that head. Um, just as a very uh, quick introduction, these are some of the, the points of the boxer head, so we can uh, standardize terminology. We can all, we, we all call the, the, the depression where the muzzle ends and the skull starts as the stop, and uh, all these other uh, structures that I believe uh, we all know. <laughs> Um, and I would suggest that uh, if we get uh, our understanding of the correct expression of a boxer, if you can see that, if you can feel that, uh, uh, most likely you have a good head in front of you. Uh, the, standard is, uh, uh, the standard describes expression basically as intelligent and alert. This is Salgrave's flying high. I believe he, he nails that to a T. And that happens because the eyes are dark, because uh, the muzzle is square and is in proportion with the skull. And I will address that uh, real quickly. But that um, expression is the, the result of a well-built, well-put-together head. Probably the most important part that, that defines the boxer head is a very unique square muzzle. And the muzzle is square because of its width, depth, and length. Uh, the ideal muzzle is about half, uh, the length of the muzzle should be half the length of the skull, or one third the length of the total head, measured from the tip of the nose to the occiput uh, uh, between the ears. Um, when you get dogs like normally bred in Europe where the muzzle is too short, you get too much underjaw. Uh, the opposite seems to happen more often in, in uh, American lines where the muzzle is a little too long. When that happens, you lose the underjaw. In reality, the underjaw, when, when you shorten the head of a, of a dog so through selective breeding, uh, the underjaw doesn't really follow the shortening of the head. So if the head gets too short, the underjaw obviously will not follow that, and you have too much of an undershot bite. And when you have a muzzle that's too long, uh, um, the, under, the underjaw still tends to remain about the same size. And then what happens is that dogs with muzzles that are too long, you have what's called an overlip, which means the upper lip covers the, the bottom. And when you have a muzzle that's too short, you have the opposite where the bottom lip is too protruding. And what you really want is that the lips, upper and lower, meet evenly. 
like you can, like you can see on, on that head on top, which is, um, again, flying high. In order to have a proper muzzle, the standard says there are three parameters that we have to pay attention to. One is the formation of the jaw bones, like I said, the, the, the length and uh, uh, proportions of uh, both upper and lower jaw. The placement of the teeth, where you want the jaw to be wide with the canine set wide apart and, the third, and, and properly under, uh, undershot, uh, that is the relationship of the canines and the incisors of the top and the bottom jaw, and then the texture of the lip. You want a thick, well-padded uh, lip for boxers. So if you have all these ingredients, you end up getting uh, the proper square muzzle. Um, a note about uh, the undershot bite. Um, it's a common practice when you judge dogs in America that you just approach the head from the front and open the, the lips and examine the bite from the front, which is uh, a standard procedure and, and, and quite accurate if you're talking about dogs that have a scissor bite like a Doberman or a pointer. But when you're talking about boxers, we need to pay a little more attention. Uh, very often you'll see breeder judges not only checking the front of the bite, but comparing both sides. The reason for that is that the standard calls for the, um, the standard calls for the back part of the lower canine that's right here to be sitting right in front of the upper part of the front part of the upper corner incisor. So when people say, okay, boxer is an undershot breed, how much is that undershot bite supposed to be? How far forward is it supposed to go? I would say about the width of the canine, which could also be compared to the, the width of a pencil. But uh, instead of trying to uh, evaluate that from the front, if you go and check both sides, you'll get to see the, the proper correlation of the lower canine with the upper corner incisor. And you also get to evaluate the symmetry of the bite where you compare the right side to the left side. This is something that's important not just because of the bite, but because it also helps determine the um, square muzzle. And of course, uh, you would expect that the space in the me medium between the two center incisors on top and the bottom are, are aligned, so the jaw is not deviated to one side or the other. Um, an important feature of the boxer bite is that you expect the canines to be set wide apart in the bottom, and you expect the, the line of incisors to be straight and possibly sitting between the canines, so they are framed by the canines. Not an easy feature to find, but once you see one, you'll never forget. Uh, if there's uh, any old-timer here that had the chance to know a dog that actually won the national here a, a few years ago called uh, Heldebrand's Jet Breaker, that is probably one of the best bites I have ever seen, and uh, I wish we had photos of that to show. I don't, but I do consider myself lucky enough to have had a chance to see that. Um, one more uh, um, comment about the undershot bite. There's a reason for boxers to be undershot. Originally, this breed uh, uh, was used for a sport that's not exactly very noble, but it was... Um, fighting with bulls and, and grabbing on to, to bulls. In order to do that, the undershot bite would provide a good uh, grip without cutting. And I've seen that with uh, an illustration of that that Stephanie uh, used to do at the, Stephanie Abrahams used to do at the, the judges seminar where she, she would show with her hands and a towel how the undershot bite would, would hold the towel and not allow it to slip. Um, and I thought, it's interesting, but if this is really functional like that, maybe if I researched a little, I would be able to find an example in nature, at, uh, in nature where some other undershot animal would be doing the exact same thing, where you have the form of the undershot bite and the function of grabbing on without cutting. And uh, I actually found it, and this is very non-scientific, but nonetheless, I found it to be interesting. Um, vampire bats are undershot. And vampire bats 
uh, in order to, to drink blood will cling on to the skin and they're not supposed to cut the skin otherwise they would fall off and uh, even though it's a, a quite a different scenario the function and the form are quite similar and, and um, I, I do see the, the parallel there. Um, moving on to the uh, shape of the eye and the skull. Our standard, and this is in my view a mistake the way that the standard currently is written, our standard says that the boxer should have eyes set frontal. And I also think that there's a problem with our standard where of all the working breeds, in uh, um, AKC working breeds, every single standard will address the shape of the eye. Our breed uh, is a head breed and it's the only standard in the American Kennel Club that does not address a shape for the eye of the boxer. And I do have a problem with that and I do wish that the standard committee would address it. So in order for us to have an idea of, of what this could be or what this should be, I'm uh, uh, bringing some parallels with heads that are extremely short and heads that are extremely long and try to make a, a, a comment about the shape and placement of the eye. When you shorten a head a lot to, to extreme, like a Pekingese, then you really have the eye going frontal. The shorter the head, the more frontal the placement of the eye. The more frontal the placement of the eye, the more circular the eye will be. So when you look at a Pekingese, when you look at an English toy spaniel, you see this very circular, round, full eye. Now if you go to the opposite uh, um, extreme and you elongate the head, like in a Doberman, what happens is that the eye starts to elongate along with the, the length of the head and the placement, which was originally frontal in the Pekingese, starts to go really, really lateral. And what you have is an eye that's placed lateral and with a shape what's called uh, almond shape. Well, boxers, according to our standard, the, uh, basically just says not set too deep, not too protruding, or not too deep set. So we all know what the boxer eye is not supposed to be. The standard doesn't say what it is supposed to be. First of all, it's not frontal. It's not like a Pekingese at all. So I would say the placement of the eye tends to be frontal. And then when it comes to shape, um, Judy Horton from Australia has this really great website. And in her study of the, the, the boxer standard, she suggests that the right shape of the boxer eye is the shape of a lemon. And I sincerely think it's a perfect description. Um, it tends to be circular but it's not. It has well-defined uh, um, corners in, inside and outside corner, and it's not almond shape. So when you look at the photo down below and the lemon uh, at the side, I think that this is down to a T. Maybe it's not a, a good word because we associate lemon uh, in this country with uh, cars that don't work or, or <laughs> things that we purchase that don't work, but if we left that concept uh, to the side and look at the shape itself, it's quite accurate. Um, other things that, that affect uh, uh, the eye department is uh, one, uh, unpigmented eyelids, uh, third eyelids or, or haws, which uh, dogs have uh, not only the upper and the lower haw, they have a, th a, a palpebra um, lids, they have a third one that's on the inner corner of the eye and the function of it is to produce uh, um, a tear film and it also has uh, a produce immunity as well. It has uh, lymph nodes there, uh, lymphatic tissue that, that produces uh, immunity or, or defense. So um, it's an important structure and typically it will be pigmented with a black band on the outer rim. Sometimes it comes unpigmented on both sides or one side. The reason for that is because of the white markings. There's not a strict correlation, but there is some level of correlation where you have what we call fleshy dogs, dogs with white markings on the face, and uh, the occurrence of the unpigmented eyelid. And that would be the picture on the center. I'm, I'm not quite sure how, how visible that is. Um, I just want to make a comment about that. 
It produces tear, it produces immunity, and it may or may not be pigmented. The second concept that it may or may not be pigmented is absolutely irrelevant compared to the importance of producing tear, which is a, a protective film, and immunity. So there is a practice of, of uh, some breeders and some vets of removing that uh, for cosmetic reasons. Because if it's unpigmented and you remove it, what you have behind is the, the color part of the eye, the iris. And often what you have at a first moment is a better looking eye. And then at a second moment, at a later year, uh, what, something that's called dry eye syndrome. Uh, sometimes up to 60% of the, the production of tear of the eye comes from the third eyelid. So removing that, according to the American Kennel Club, it's a disqualification. I wish that judges would enforce that. Um, the next aspect that I also would like to mention about uh, the boxer eye has to do with the color. Uh, the standard calls for a dark eye. And uh, in fact, the dark eye uh, produces that intelligent alert and expression, whereas a light eye uh, will produce a, a more menacing look. Uh, our older versions of the, the standard would refer to that as uh, expression of bird of prey. And that, that terminology was removed, but the idea of the dark eye remains, the importance of the dark eye remains the same. Um, while I have this picture, one more thing I would like to, to address which is the black mask. Um, the black mask uh, is an uh, expansion of the pigment of the nose, the lips, and the eyelids. It's like if you put a drop of ink on cardboard and you see that ink expand, that's what a black mask is. It's the exact same uh, mechanism. So sometimes um, what people are doing at the dog show is trying to enhance and I put that in quotations, the black mask, by dyeing it black. I've seen several today and yesterday. It's a disqualification. It's not something that the AKC allows you to do. It's not necessary. And I wish uh, exhibitors would stop doing that. And I also wish judges would be a little more severe in pointing that out and penalizing accordingly. There is no benefit to the gene pool and to the breeding program in producing phony versions of a working dog. This is not uh, uh, something that I, I see any purpose for. All right. Our older standard used to uh, require cropped ears. The current standard correctly allows you for a choice. We do have uh, an influx of uh, European dogs we also do have um, uh, breeders with the desire of not have their puppies go through the ear crop. We could probably speak about ear crop for hours, the pros and cons. I will not do that. Instead, I would like to just say that if the ear is to be cropped, it would be interesting to find a, a, a design and a technique where it enhances the expression, where it's uh, elegant, and it blends with the rest of the body, or if it's left in the natural uh, um, version, that it should uh, break right at the base and lay flat against the cheeks and the head, and it should have a very well-defined crease, so it's not that curvy, flying ear. It's not just because you didn't crop the ear that you're gonna have a correct ear on, on your dog. Um, Breeders that were exposed to lots of good cartilage and bad cartilage will know which kind of uh, uh, ear should be cropped, which kind of ear should be left intact. Um, and then again, markings. Um, boxers are allowed to uh, have white markings on the face. Uh, the standard actually uses that, that terminology, that uh, white may be present, not must be present, which means that if it's not, if it's what's called a classic or, or plain or, or uh, whatever terminology we want to use for that, it should be equally appreciated and should not be penalized. The idea that dogs that are born with white markings are show dogs and those who are born without it are pets, 
is incorrect and a whole lot of precious gene pool has been waste, uh, gone to waste because of, of this uh, uh, incorrect notion. The standard also says that the white markings on, I'll be quick, uh, the white markings on the face should enhance the expression and sometimes it just so happens that it's excessive and it doesn't. But the standard doesn't really say how much it is correct or incorrect. Therefore, I would say that the correct amount of white is the one that allows you to see the proper express expression for the breed. And then just to, to wrap it all up, I would like to say that really the breeding of boxes in America did go full circle. And when you get to see the, mo the modern uh, boxer head, we do get reminded of the 1905 uh, Munich profile. And uh, as long as we have that in our minds, we uh, accomplish the, the, the vision of the original forefathers of our breed. Um, and just to, to finish this, I would like to say a very special thank you to Jane Hamilton Guy, who provided with me with most of the pictures I presented to you guys today. And without her help, this PowerPoint would not have been possible. So thank you, guys. Okay, we have um, some really good examples of boxer heads that we want to put on the table and uh, sort of critique for you. Um, we've got examples of what we feel is a good balanced head. We've got an example of a narrow underjaw, an example of, help me out, Beth. Rye. Rye. Overdone. Overdone. Uh, cheeky. And, and um, we'd like to thank all of the owners of these dogs uh, for allowing us to critique them and uh, so we'll be as kind as we can. This, this dog's head uh, is, I, in my mind, is balanced. Uh, it has a tip up. Uh, it, it's, it's fairly wide under jaw, which I don't know if we can get that open for the video or. Yeah, you can look at his mouth too. And... Yeah. Danny, do you want to critique while I'm. Well, I can start, right? Sure. Okay. Right. Since this is my dog, I can pick on him. Um, I don't know if Dan talked about the cube on cube, but I think he's pretty consistent with cube on cube. He's got a very wide underbite, and he's got about a canine in between the lower and upper incisor. Is that what it's called, an incisor? Yeah. Okay. Um, his eyes are a little bit wide set, but he still has a very soft expression. And he's a brat. He's got a nice wide black nose. You see a lot of dogs with small noses. His ear set could be a little higher on the back, on the top of his head. He's a little bit wide in between his ears. But basically, a, a good boxer head. He's, if you see him from the side, you can see the tip up of his nose. Turn his face that way. Like, just use the, the tickets. tickets. He'll look yeah. at you. Yeah. Can you see the tip up? Now, it, it, my criticism of this dog's of this dog's head and headpiece, I would like to see his his eye a little tighter. Um, he's just just droops down a little bit much, and um, I'd also I'm a a bug on high ear set, and I'd like to see him with a higher ear set. Uh, the ears higher on the on the skull, if you if you could. Get him up there. Dan, yeah, yeah. Okay, Dan, anything to, to add? I think it's a very pleasing head. I would just bring his under jaw forward or the nose back just a little to have the upper and lower lip meeting more evenly like this. Did you get a good view of the mouth before? Yeah. You want to critique it or would you like me to? You can. All right. Uh, what I would like, this is a very pleasant, uh, pleasing head to, to my eye. I um, omitted mentioning earlier that uh, the proper boxer head, when you have a square muzzle 
and the proper back, uh, width of back skull and depth of stop, what you will have is a very well-defined wrinkle that goes from the inner corner of the eye to the outer corner of the lip on both sides. This dog shows that very properly, and that's an important thing. You can also see the, the line of the lips, the upper and lower lip meet, meeting evenly, and when you see on a profile, you see a slight turn up to the nose, which I find it very attractive and, and proper. I, I like this head. And very nice soft eyes. Yes. But if I had to pick on it? Yes. Can I pick on it? Yes. He definitely needs Phil. Yes. He needs Phil. We would all like to see a little more Phil under the eyes right in here. And um, I'm going to open his mouth now, pass the mic off to somebody else. We'd all like to see a wider bite. But this is very, very, uh, probably an above average on the good side mouth at this point. <laughs> How's that, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Very, very correct. You'll see this 80% of the time when you open dogs' mouths, I think. You didn't judge. I didn't judge today, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Any questions on this? And beautiful piece? soft eye on this yeah. dog. Yeah. yeah. See how it's nice and dark and soft. And, and very balanced. The shape of the eye is pretty. A beautiful soft eye on this dog. Nice dark eye, very soft expression. The eye shape is correct. I don't know if it's a lemon, almond, but lemon. It's, yeah. not it's not an almond. almond. And it's not, and it's it's not a lemon. Not globular. Yeah. So a lemon. <laughs> this, yeah. this is a good example of a headpiece that's that's one third, two thirds, the one third, two thirds. Uh, probably a pro very proper, very correct. Front muzzle, one third. You see that? I know it's not the place for this. I just want to get it on the record that um, Dan and I have a respectful disagreement about eye shape description, and I would suggest that it is not the boxer eye is not shaped like a lemon, and certainly not like an almond. And we can have a a, a whole seminar on that one day, and maybe we should. <laughs> Here, Dan. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, there are two separate things, but in reality, when you have uh, pushed in faces, you tend to have uh, well developed cheeks. The boxer is supposed to be rather flat, and when you have a strong muzzle with good padding underneath, you have a very smooth transition. The only thing that, that you could really notice that, that makes the transition of uh, one side to the next is the presence of the very well-developed wrinkle that's called for in the standard. I don't know if I answer your question, but that's my, my perception. That's yep. That was a very tough question. Yes. Stop. You know better. Yeah, I would like him to be wider. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a dog we have for an example that at Stay. seeing him just walking around and not being able to open his mouth, you would think that he would have a very wide under jaw and it's a little narrow. Yes. And that's the example. That's why he's here. And um, the reason for that is that he's extremely well padded though. Yes. So it looks square. So sometimes, sometimes you'll see, um, you know, uh, uh, the dog and you're, out, you're sitting outside the ring and you're saying, well, geez, I don't know why you didn't put that dog first in the class. Well, there you go. You know, it's a, it wasn't as wide as it looked from ringside, okay? It's a good mouth, it's, it's just a, not yeah. wide enough. Right, right. I, I, mean, I just want to point out in this particular head uh, how nicely the transition of the black mass towards the ground color is. It's a smooth and natural. He's well pigmented. The nose is black, the eyelids are black, the eyes are dark and uh, totally natural, no, no dye jobs here. This is a beautiful headpiece, I think. Yes. So. Yes. Deceiving a little. Yes. <laughs> nice ear set and the correct wrinkling on the top of the skull when the ears are alert. Okay, thank you. Next.
This is Beth's dog, so uh, we're going to let Beth go first. And okay, I just brought him up so you can see an example of Cheeky. Does everyone know what Cheeky is? This is it. Cheeky. Head, it's round. Round. you got round cheeks, which is cute, but it's incorrect. From the side, can we do a... Get a side profile. Okay. You could use a little more of the jaw as well with the upper yep, lip. Yep, absolutely. It's covering, it's got what's called an over lip. The upper lip is covering the lower lip. And this is an AKC champion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Finished very easily. Very easily. Lots of other qualities in this dog. The one thing we brought him here for you to see is cheeky. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another AKC champion. Another champion. Too clean. So not enough wrinkle, not enough depth of muzzle, and she's got a mic on her. Yeah. And his nose, if you see him from the side, is too straight. There's very little tip up, and it goes a little beyond one-third, do you think? One-third, yeah. two-third? Also an AKC champion finished easily, right. because he has other qualities, but too clean in the head. Bite is? Bite is not, it's very tight. Actually, that's remarkably wide. Yeah. Not particularly even, if you see right. the canines. No, it's, it's not even. Can you see that? Yes, you're holding still. Good. Questions? Yeah. So there's a, li a little more on one side of a space than the other. We're good. All right. All right. Any uh, any questions? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Here, you want your mic back? What did you mean by too clean? Oh, do I have to say this on the thing? You can hold it on the hand. I can hold it. Okay. I'm not good with with quoting the boxer standard, but if you look at him, he has almost no wrinkling. Absence of padding. Yep. I wouldn't right. say that he lacks fill. He's fill under the, he has fill under the this eyes. This isn't thick enough. This is very thin. And there's not enough wrinkle. He goes wrinkle. into a snipey situation where the, the head goes this way. It's well, I don't think it's, I disagree with that. And not saying this because he's my dog. I think that his back skull is wider than his muzzle. And that's, that's where you're saying snipey. No, snipey to me means a point. Well, no. Okay. Well, the combination, the okay. combination of all <laughs> these things together. Yeah. The, the, uh, I don't see the squareness of muzzle in this dog as I saw in the previous two classic dogs. So yeah, the I fact agree. that this muzzle is less developed and the fact that his back part of the, the head is, is wide and it uh, tapers abruptly gives the impression of a certain snipiness, which you don't see, and I do. <laughs> no, I well, just think the word's wrong. You know, you say potato, I say patata, but um, it's a combination of all the pieces of the head that gives it the appearance of being a little snipey or a little too clean. Too Lack clean. Of between the skull and muscle. Right. Oh, and, right. And 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 Cheryl said <laughs> Cheryl said this earlier, this is a balanced breed. Everything has to be in balance. Um, we didn't bring you an example of a dog whose head is too small for his body or a dog whose head is too big for his body, but you see that a lot as well. It's all about balance. When the dog comes in the ring or when you see the dog and you're evaluating him as a stud dog, all the pieces should belong together. It shouldn't be a front end, back end, and a middle, and a head. And Ted Fick has taught me that about 25 years ago. So. Uh, Anyway, somebody else had a question over here? No? We're done? <laughs> I want to thank everyone for taking all the time that they did today. I hope it helped. We're going to continue with these Boxer U sessions at every regional and every national. When you have ideas, please send them to me, and we'll find someone who can do them. I know next year Regan Ray has agreed to do something on both herding and tracking. And I know at the regional, 
in Portland, Michelle Yeadon is going to do something on puppy raising and puppy socialization. So anytime you have any ideas, my email's all over the place, give me a call. And if you can do something, please, we share information. That's how we learn. Thanks a lot. Thank you.